Hi everyone, back for video number two. We are going to focus on the church, the medieval church in this one, and the Crusades, which are the wars inspired by the church in the Middle Ages. Uh, we're gonna take a look at that. So I'm going to share my screen for you. And I minimize myself up there. All right, the power of the church. This video is going to be a little bit longer, but my goal here is to keep it under 15 minutes. So let's see how we can do. Power of the church, section four of the European Middle Ages unit. So let's set the stage for a second. Amid the weak central governments in feudal Europe, right, feudalism takes the power away from the central government. So any type of feudalism is decentralized government. So among those weak central governments in feudal Europe, the church emerged as a powerful institution. It was one entity that kept lots of different people together. It shaped the lives of people from all social classes. As the church expanded its political role, strong rulers did begin to question the Pope's authority. And because of that, dramatic power struggles unfolded in the Holy Roman Empire, which was the scene of mounting tensions between popes and emperors. Far-reaching authority. The church and the monarchs, the kings and the queens in Europe all competed for power. The church, however, had its own power structure. So while Obviously, feudalism has one power structure. The church does have its own pyramid within it that is covering its own levels. They're all in the church's power structure based on status. The church often acted as a place of stability. It was a little bit chaotic to live during this time in the Middle Ages, and the church was able to give people calmness and stability during that time. The authority of the church was both religious and political. It reached into both arenas. Age of faith. Influenced by the religious devotion and reverence for God, it's the belief and deep respect for God that was shown by new monasteries, the Pope began to reform the church. We see for the first time the church changing some things that it had been doing. So people who wanted to reform the church are distressed. They are upset by three main issues. Issue number one is priests marrying. Priests were getting married. They weren't technically supposed to be doing that. Number two, simony which was the practice of selling church positions. So if somebody wanted to be in the church hierarchy, they could pay some money and that would get them in. And then the third major issue that reformers were upset by was bishop appointment. How and who was being appointed bishops. So in the early 1200s, friars began to travel to spread church ideas. And these were people who went from the church out to spread the ideas of the church throughout Europe. One of these friars was Francis of Assisi, and he founded the Franciscan Order of Friars, which is one of the most famous groups of friars from this time period. There were cathedrals built earlier in the Middle Ages, in the early Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages, and then more cathedrals built over time. And we see two distinct styles of cathedrals form at this point. So we're gonna talk first about the older style, it comes from the early Middle or the Dark Ages, and that was the Romanesque style of architecture. So these cathedrals were built between 800 and 1000. They were marked by rounded arches, thick walls and pillars. They had very teeny tiny windows, so we're not talking about a lot of light really being able to shine into the churches. The Gothic style, however, came to be in the 1100s. These churches, the Gothic style, was built with pointed roofs. So it almost seemed as if the entire building was reaching itself upward toward heaven. It was meant to look as though the building 
was pointed up. And we see a lot of stained glass in that Gothic style. When you think of stained glass windows in churches, uh, one of the most prominent cathedrals that you might think of would be, yep, that's right, Notre Dame in Paris. Buildings like Notre Dame, those types of cathedrals, they were built to inspire people, to make them believe that they could do things and could be better for God. This is the Notre Dame in Paris. Obviously, it sustained fire last year. You may remember that happening. There was damage done to the building, and there is a lot of restoration being done presently to restore and repair this incredibly beautiful building. So it's a picture from the ground and the side here. This is a picture of the famous stained glass window. It's also known as the rose window, very famous stained glass art. And then this is a shot from the other side and in the sky, an aerial view. And that brings us to the Crusades. The Age of Faith inspired wars of conquest, wars where people wanted to just conquer, to take over other areas. In 1095, the Byzantine emperor at the time contacted Pope Urban II, gave them a call and said, hey, there is this major military threat that is coming against Constantinople. And the Byzantine emperor was very concerned about Muslim control of Jerusalem. So Pope Urban II called for a crusade against the Muslim Turks. What exactly is a crusade? It is a holy war. So Pope Urban II called for a war inspired by God to go against the Muslim Turks to regain control of Jerusalem. So who went? Who were the crusaders, the soldiers that took place in this war? Well, we see tens of thousands of peasants, nobles, and clergy respond to Pope Urban II's call for war. And in the spring and the summer of 1096, armies, very large armies of crusaders departed, left from Western Europe for Constantinople. There are a total of nine major crusades, but we're going to start talking with the earlier ones. They are the more important and more significant crusades. Between 1096 and 1099, Crusader armies made their way to Jerusalem. That very first crusade had absolutely no strategy and no leadership. The church said, hey, let's go to war. And these people said, okay, I'm coming. There was not any real thought or organization put into that. However, despite this, on July 17th, 1099, Crusaders captured Jerusalem. They were able to take it back from the Muslims after a very long and costly siege. Well, it maintains under control of the Christians, Jerusalem, um, for a while, actually, um, until 1144, when a city to the north of Jerusalem called Edessa fell to the Muslims. And a second crusade was organized. Again, the Pope comes and says, hey, we need to go to war. We need to go get this land back. And so it was organized to recapture Edessa. Unfortunately, the second crusade didn't go quite as well as the first. And both Edessa and Jerusalem were lost to a very famous crusader named Saladin. Saladin was a Muslim leader in the crusades. And he was and is the, uh, one of the most famous Muslims from this time and from the Crusades. And it is his leadership and his strength that we see allow the Muslims to recapture Edessa and Jerusalem. This is a map for you so you can maybe get a better visual idea of how much people were moving in this time. So a lot of people coming from here in Western Europe, what is today Portugal, Spain, France, they are moving from there and going all the way to Jerusalem. So it was not a short trip. Yes, some people did come by ship. However, most people 
came over land in order to get there. So there are two different groups in the Crusades. There are the Christians and there are the Muslims, and they have two very different perspectives of this fighting. Christians believe that they were fighting in the name of Jesus to take back the place of his birth from the infidels. An infidel is a person who follows a religion other than one's own. So anyone who wasn't Christian was believed to be an infidel. So the Christians believed they were fighting against the infidels. They were doing it in Jesus's name. Well, the Muslims believed that they were defending land that was theirs. From their perspective, Christians were the invaders. They had taken control of this land. They had won it fair and square. It was theirs at that point. And so they believed that Christians were invading. This you know, brought the two groups really to a, to a head, to a breaking point. Uh, there was really no way around a compromise there. There was no way to make a real compromise. So like I said, altogether, there were nine major crusades. The religious spirit, the let's do this for God belief that we see so many of these crusaders go for, um, that fades over time. Uh, one of the Crusades is even a children's crusade. This took place in 1212, one of the later crusades. Thousands of children who were 10 to 18 years old set out to conquer Jerusalem. That crusade was not won by the children. Um, in fact, most of those children did not even make it to Jerusalem. Whether they died or they were sold into slavery, uh, many drowned at sea, all these different things, um, many horrible atrocities uh, found them and it was not ultimately successful. Later, Muslims in Spain, known as Moors, were driven out in the Reconquista, which was the long-term effort by the Spanish to drive the Muslims out of Spain. So this is an extension of the Crusades that we see occur in Spain instead of in the Middle East. And finally, the effects of the Crusades on the people who fought them were widespread and often devastating, although not always. These are the six major effects of the Crusades. One, thousands left their homes and traveled. These are people I am talking about who had never traveled further than the five square miles on which they were born. And now we see thousands of people not only leaving those five square miles, but traveling hundreds and thousands of miles. And that was the first time we had really seen that happen in Europe. Number two, women had a chance to manage the affairs at home, to manage the household and the estate as a whole. And we see them really being able to adapt and being able to do all of those things, really showing Europeans at the time that women were capable. And three, European merchants expanded their trade routes. They were able to trade further and with more people, and that allowed for newer ideas of culture to enter Europe. The failure of later crusades lessened the power of the Pope as the Crusades failed over and over again, especially those later ones, the Pope was able to maintain less power over the European people. The Crusades also weakened feudal nobility. We start to see what would eventually be the end of feudalism because of the Crusades. And last, very certainly not least, for Muslims, the intolerance and prejudice that was created due to the Crusades left behind a legacy of bitterness and hatred. Certainly a more devastating effect of the Crusades. For the work accompanying the Crusades, uh, there are different assignments. My CCP students, you are going to be working on a worksheet of the Crusades, um, a Lady Lion Crusades worksheet, and my honors and advanced students, you're going to be reading different primary sources um, all about the church and the Crusades. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know.